Hello, everyone. Kanisha Grayson, founder and CEO of The Art of Applying here. Today, we are speaking with Steve Schwartz. He is the founder of the LSAT blog, as well as the host of the LSAT Unplugged podcast and the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel. Thanks so much for being here today, Steve. Thanks for having me, Kanisha. I'm really excited to get into the nitty gritty of talking about the LSAT today. But before we jump in, why don't you just tell us a little bit about the LSAT blog, the podcast, and the YouTube channel, and how you help people? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. So I've been running the LSAT blog for over 10 years now. It started as an outgrowth of my one-on-one -on -one coaching with students individually. I wanted to share free advice with everyone and reach more people. And so I started putting that out there. I ended up publishing over 1,000 articles on every aspect of LSAT preparation. And more recently, I've branched into YouTube and podcasting. So I have the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel where I have recordings of online classes and in-person classes here in NYC, full hour-long plus classes on everything LSAT and law school admissions. I also have discussions like this, as well as shorter bite-sized videos on specific topics. And then all that same information on the YouTube channel, I also post it on the podcast so you can listen on the go. Okay, this is a wealth and a treasure trove of LSAT information, awesome. Man, I love it. So we've been running our businesses around the same amount of time. We, we've seen a lot of people come and go, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> All right. So one of the most common ways I think a lot of people start studying for the LSAT is just kind of dipping their toe in with self-study. So I would love to just hear about how you help people um, who are just thinking that they're going to do the kind of DIY route. And is that even a good idea? I think DIY is actually perfectly fine. I think that Self-study has to be an integral part of any LSAT study process. Even if you take a course like mine or somebody else's, doesn't matter. You've got to put in the work on your end. So that means mm -hmm. putting in the time with the actual official LSAT exams, their previously administered exams called LSAT prep tests. You can buy most of them in books of 10 for about $20 each on Amazon. So you get your hands on those, but you don't want to just go through exam after exam, measure your results and be happy or sad about them and move on. The growth comes from detailed review of everything you get wrong, everything you have difficulty with, and you also want to give yourself a chance to learn the basics first. So there's three mm -hmm. phases of LSAT studying, accuracy, which is working untimed, doing questions by type, and building your foundation. Mm -hmm. Then there's pacing with individual 35-minute timed sections. Then finally, there's endurance with full-length five-section timed exams, because you will be doing five sections on test day itself. Ah, oh, okay. So it's accuracy, pacing, and you said endurance? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. What a, what a great model to conceptualize what people need to be able to do. Um, so one thing that I know I always tell people with the application process as a whole is to start early. How early do you find people coming to you and how early do you recommend people start their LSAT studying? That's a great question. So most people want to spend only two to three months max. They feel like that's what they did for the SAT. So it should be the same for the LSAT, but the LSAT is honestly much harder. And mm -hmm. it's also much more important than the SAT. You earn your undergraduate GPA over the course of typically three to five years. You get, you get your LSAT score and that's more important. So it's certainly worth spending more than two to three months on that alone. So I typically recommend five to six months at least. And I have study plans on my site for all different periods of time, whether you're taking one month or you're taking six months, I've got a plan for you broken down in that framework of accuracy, pacing, and endurance. Okay, fantastic. What's the earliest you've ever seen someone start studying for the LSAT? I've seen people do it for over a year. And it, honestly, it took, me, it took me a year myself and it, it shouldn't, you know, I studied inefficiently and people don't always plan to study for that long. But I, I do hear from co college freshmen who want to get a jump on it and I tell them, Take, take, take some time. You don't need to start yet. You could read a book on informal logic if you want, but I think six months is enough for most people. How interesting. I thought you were going to be excited about the college freshman because I actually love the idea. Because how long is the LSAT um, eligible for? How long does it last? That's a great question. So it, it is good for, the score is good for five years. So someone five could, years. Take it, could take it as a college freshman and then apply without ever taking it again. That well, is possible. Or maybe like sophomore or junior year or something like that. I don't know. I'm one of those like start super early people, especially. Well, junior year, yeah. I mean, junior year, I think is totally fine. The thing is you don't want to burn through pre too much practice, practice material. And you also don't want to burn out. And the other thing I tell folks is that you could change your career path during college. The college freshman who pours a year into studying then decides junior year they actually want to do something else. 
they spent a year studying the LSAT. Maybe they could tutor on the side for some extra cash, but that wouldn't necessarily serve their, their goals. That's right. That's right. Okay, so what are some of the common mistakes you see people make in studying for the LSAT and then actually on test day while taking the test? Yeah, sure. So studying for the LSAT, the biggest mistake is not properly reviewing or not reviewing at all. So I mentioned people want to take exam after exam and measure themselves. What you want to do instead is every problem that you have difficulty with, figure out what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made you consider or pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong. And what's discouraging about the right answer choice that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. You want to write this out by hand or type it or talk to somebody about it, but actually articulate your thought process. Mm -hmm. That's where the growth comes from so you can avoid making the same mistakes again. And then on test day itself, the biggest mistake I'd say is probably getting bogged down on particular questions when they're all worth the same. If one question's not doing it for you, you're not making any headway, skip it, move on, hope to come back later. Okay, great. And then I know that there are some policy changes happening this year. I would love to have you share with everyone about what those changes are and how they would affect test takers. Sure. So there are a couple I could talk about. One is that the LSAT is being offered more frequently than ever before. It used to be only four times a year. Now it's going to be nine or 10 times a year going forward. And a lot of the test dates are month after month. So you could take it in June, then take it again in July. You could take it in September, October, November. The nice thing about that is, let's say you are registered for June, you could take it in July as well as a retake and only study for an additional four weeks and potentially get a higher score. So that's well worth doing if you think you can do better. So that's one big change. The other big change is that the LSAT is going digital this year. It's been on paper and pencil forever. It's like the last standardized test, at least grad level, to be on paper. They're going to be digital starting in July, and it's going to be on a tablet, not a computer, a tablet. And so I'd encourage folks to get a tablet if they don't have one, or at least start studying with PDFs to get a sense of how to do the problems on the screen with scrap paper on the side. Okay, so it'll be a tablet, and then where there'll be a stylus, or you'll have scrap paper on the side, and you're like using your finger to choose the answer. Yeah, great question. So there is a stylus, and you're using the stylus to choose the answer, but you can't draw freehand on the tablet with your stylus the way you might expect. Instead, the stylus has a pen on the other side, and you use the pen to write on the scrap paper. You know what's going to happen is a bunch of really messed up tablets with people using real pens on the, st on the <laughs> tablet. That's, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be very expensive. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right. So as you know, uh, we help people apply to law school, business school, and policy school. Um, and the GRE recently started getting accepted by more and more business schools. And then we started to see a few and then a growing list of law schools accepting the GRE. I'd love to hear about what you think about that, Steve, and also just any advice or insights you have about people, you know, deciding to choose between the LSAT or the GRE or both. Yeah, sure. Well, first, I'll get my personal biases out of the way. I think the LSAT is a much better exam than the GRE is. The LSAT has a strong demonstrated correlation with first-year law school grades, which also then correlate with bar passage rates. The GRE doesn't have the same evidence supporting its usage for law school specifically. But that aside, um, of course, we want to look at the applicants and what is best for them, right? So mm -hmm. let's say you have, you cannot do the LSAT for the life of you. You can't crack 150, but you could do a lot better on the GRE. Then okay. I would say do not even take an official LSAT because once you have that LSAT score on your record, then law schools will have to submit that score to the American Bar Association, which then gets factored into the US News Ranking. So let's say you took an official LSAT and got like a 145. You then say, you know what? The LSAT's not for me. I'll do the GRE. That's a mistake because that 145 will still be considered by the law schools as your LSAT score. So you got to know beforehand if it's right for you or not. Mm -hmm. And how do people know if it's right for them, Steve? Well, they could study for a bit, see how it goes. After they've studied for a decent chunk of time, then take a diagnostic. And of course, it does take more than a few months. So if law school is really your focus, invest a few months, invest three or four months at least and see if you're progressing. If you're not, then maybe consider the GRE. But otherwise, of course, the LSAT is the major, the, the major game in town for law schools. I talked to a UCLA law dean of admissions yesterday, and he was saying that they've taken 5% of their applicants with GRE scores as like a rough ballpark. Mm -hmm. So 5% GRE, 
95% LSAT. Right. And so I, it's also UCLA is like a top school. So I wonder if those folks might have done well on the LSAT anyway. For lower tier law schools, maybe it's a different story though. Okay. All right. And any other advice that you would have for people who are gearing up to get ready to create their plan for studying for the LSAT? They feel very clear they want to go to law school. They're committed. And the first step is to get started. What's the best place to start? First step is the study plans I have on my site, the LSAT blog. I have day-by-day -day study plans breaking down exactly what you want to do every single day over the course of your prep, as well as what not to do. So they're super specific, telling you, read these pages in this prep book, complete these practice problems out of the actual LSAT exams, the three phases, accuracy, pacing, endurance. You start there see how it goes. And then of course you consider my live online classes, live in-person classes, one-on-one, -on -one, variety of different options I have for you, but the study schedules are, I think are the first step. Fantastic. And where can people find you online? I, I know it's a lot of places, so let them know. Yeah, sure. So if they, if they can't find the other places, just email me, <laughs> lsatunplugged at gmail.com. Very simple. The website is the LSAT blog. Just Google Steve Schwartz LSAT blog. You'll find it. I also have the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. You can search the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your insights and for being here today, Steve. Thanks for having me, Kenesha. It was a pleasure.